Welcome back to Pastor Emily's Story Hour. We're reading Emily of New Moon by L. M. Montgomery. Chapter 26 On the Bay Shore. I wonder, thought Emily, how much longer I have to live. She had prowled that evening further down the bay shore than she had ever gone before. It was a warm, windy evening. The air was resinous and sweet, the bay a misty turquoise. That part of the shore whereon she found herself seemed as lonely and virgin as if no human foot had ever trodden it, save for a tiny tricksy path, slender as red thread and bordered by great green velvety sheets of moss that wound in and out of the big firs and scrub spruces. The banks grew steeper and rockier as she went on, and finally the little path vanished altogether in a plot of bracken. Emily was just turning to go back when she caught sight of a magnificent spray of farewell summer growing far out on the edge of the bank. She must get it. She had never seen farewell summers of so dark and rich a purple. She stepped out to reach them. The treacherous mossy soil gave way under her feet and slid down the steep slope. Emily made a frantic attempt to scramble back, but the harder she tried, the faster went the landslide, carrying her with it. In a moment, it would pass the slope and go over the brink of the rocks straight to the boulder-strewn shore thirty feet below. Emily had one dreadful moment of terror and despair, and then she found that the clump of mossy earth which had broken away had held on a narrow ledge of rock half hanging over it, and she was lying on the clump. It seemed to her that the slightest movement on her part would send it over, straight to the cruel boulders underneath. She lay very still, trying to think, trying not to be afraid. She was far, far away from any house. Nobody could hear her if she screamed, and she did not even dare to scream lest the motion of her body dislodge the fragment on which she lay. How long could she lie there motionless? Night was coming on. Aunt Nancy would grow anxious when the dark fell and would send Caroline to look for her, but Caroline would never find her here. Nobody would ever think of looking here for her, so far away from the Grange, in the spruce barrens of the lower bay. To lie here alone all night, to fancy the earth was slipping over, waiting for help that would never come, Emily could hardly restrain a shudder that might have been ruinous. She had faced death once before, or thought she had, on the night when Lofty John had told her she had eaten a poisoned apple. But this was even harder. To die here, all alone, far away from home. They might never know what had become of her, never find her. The crows or the gulls would pick her eyes out, she dramatized the thing so vividly that she almost screamed with the horror of it. She would just disappear from the world as Ilsa's mother had disappeared. What had become of Ilsa's mother? Even in her own desperate plight, Emily asked herself that question. And she would never see dear new moon again, and Teddy, and the dairy, and the tansy patch, and Lofty John's bush, and the mossy old sundial, and her precious little heap of manuscripts on the sofa shelf in the garret. I, I must be very brave and patient, she thought. My only chance is to lie still, and I can pray in my mind. I'm sure God can hear thoughts as well as words. It is nice to think he can hear me if no one else can. Oh God, Father's God, Please work a miracle and save my life, because I don't think I'm fit to die yet. Excuse my not being on my knees. You can see I can't move. And if I die, don't let Aunt Elizabeth find my letter bills ever. Please let Aunt Laura find them. And please don't let Caroline move out the wardrobe when she house cleans, because then she would find my Jimmy book and read what I wrote about her. Please forgive all my sins, especially not being grateful enough and cutting a bang. And please don't let Father be very far away. Amen. Then, characteristically, she thought of a postscript. And oh, please let somebody find out that Ilsa's mother didn't do that. She lay very still. The light on the water began to turn warm, gold, and rose. 
A great pine on a bluff in front of her overflowed in a crest of dark boughs against the amber splendor behind it, a part of the beauty of the beautiful world that was slipping away from her. The chill of the evening gulf breeze began to creep over her. Once a bit of earth broke off at her side and went down. Emily heard the thud of the little pebbles in it on the boulders below. The portion on which one of her legs lay was quite loose and pendant also. She knew it might break off too at any moment. It would be very dreadful to be there when it got dark. She could see the big spray of farewell summer that had lured her to her doom, waving unplucked above her, wonderfully purple and lovely. Then, beside it, she saw a man's face looking at her. She'd heard him say, My God! softly to himself. She saw that he was slight, and that one shoulder was a trifle higher than the other. This must be Dean Priest, Jarback Priest. Emily dared not call to him. She lay still, and her great gray-purple eyes said, Save me. How can I help you? said Dean Priest hoarsely, as if to himself. I cannot reach you, and it looks as if the slightest touch or jar would send that broken earth over the brink. I must go for a rope, and to leave you here alone like this. Can you wait, child? Yes, breathed Emily. She smiled at him to encourage him, the little soft smile that began at the corners of her mouth and spread over her face. Dean Priest never forgot that smile and the steadfast child eyes looking out through it from the little face that seemed so perilously near the brink. I'll be as quick as I can, he said. I can't go very fast. I'm a bit lame, you see, but don't be frightened. I'll save you. I'll leave my dog to keep you company. Here, Tweed. He whistled. A great tawny gold dog came in sight. Sit right here, Tweed, till I come back. Don't stir a paw. Don't wag a tail. Talk to her only with your eyes. Tweed sat down obediently, and Dean Priest disappeared. Emily lay there and dramatized the whole incident for her Jimmy book. She was a little frightened still, but not too frightened to see herself writing it all out the next day. It would be quite a thrilling bit. She liked to know the big dog was there. She was not so learned in the lore of dogs as in the lore of cats, but he looked very human and trusty watching her with great kindly eyes. A gray kitten was an adorable thing, but a gray kitten would not have sat there and encouraged her. I believe, thought Emily, that a dog is better than a cat when you're in trouble. It was half an hour before Dean Priest returned. Thank God you haven't gone over, he muttered. I hadn't to go as far as I feared. I found a rope in an empty boat up shore and took it. And now, if I drop the rope down to you, are you strong enough to hold it while the earth goes and then hang on while I pull you up? I'll try, said Emily. Dean Priest nodded a loop at the end and slid it down to her. Then he wound the rope around the trunk of a heavy fir. Now, he said, Emily said inwardly, Dear God, please, and caught the swaying loop. The next moment, the full weight of her body swung from it, for at her first movement, the broken soil beneath her slipped down, slipped over. Dean Priest sickened and shivered. Could she cling to the rope while he drew her up? Then he saw she had got a little knee hold on the narrow shelf. Carefully, he drew on the rope. Emily, full of pluck, helped him by digging her toes into the crumbling bank. In a moment, she was within his reach. He grasped her arms and pulled her up beside him into safety. As he lifted her past the farewell summer, Emily reached out her hand and broke off the spray. I've got it anyhow, she said jubilantly. Then she remembered her manners. I'm much obliged to you. You saved my life, and... And I, I think I'll sit down a moment. My legs feel funny and trembly. Emily sat down, all at once more shaky than she had been all through the danger. Dean Priest leaned against the gnarled old fur. He seemed trembly, too. He wiped his forehead with his handkerchief. Emily looked curiously at him. She had learned a good deal about him from Aunt Nancy's casual remarks. 
not always good-natured remarks, for Aunt Nancy did not wholly like him, it seemed. She always called him Jarback rather contemptuously, while Caroline scrupulously called him Dean. Emily knew that he had been to college, that he was thirty-six years old, which to Emily seemed a venerable age, and well off, that he had a malformed shoulder and limped slightly, that he cared for nothing save books, nor ever had, that he lived with an older brother and traveled a great deal, and that the whole priest clan stood somewhat in awe of his ironic tongue. Aunt Nancy had called him a cynic. Emily did not know what a cynic was, but it sounded interesting. She looked him over carefully and saw that he had delicate, pale features and tawny brown hair. His lips were thin and sensitive, with a whimsical curve. She liked his mouth. Had she been older, she would have known why, because it connoted strength and tenderness and humor. In spite of his twisted shoulder, there was about him a certain aloof dignity of presence which was characteristic of many of the priests, and which was often mistaken for pride. The priest's eyes, that were peering and uncanny in Caroline's face and impudent in Jim Priest's, were remarkably dreamy and attractive in his. "'Well, do you think me handsome?' he said, sitting down on another stone and smiling at her. His voice was beautiful, musical, and caressing. Emily blushed. She knew staring was not etiquette, and she did not think him at all handsome, so she was very thankful that he did not press his question." but asked another. Do you know who your knightly rescuer is? I think you must be Jar Mr. Dean Priest. Emily flushed again with vexation. She had come so near to making another terrible hole in her manners. <laughs> yes, Jarback Priest. You needn't mind the nickname. I've heard it often enough. It's a priest idea of humor. He laughed rather unpleasantly. The reason for it is obvious enough, isn't it? I never got anything else at school. How came you to slide over that cliff? I wanted this, said Emily, waving her farewell summer. Ha, huh, and you have it. Do you always get what you go after, even with death slipping a thin wedge between? I think you're born lucky. I see the signs. If that big aster lured you into danger, it saved you as well, for it was through stepping over to investigate it that I saw you. Its size and color caught my eye. Otherwise, I should have gone on, and you, what would have become of you? Whom do you belong to, that you are let to risk your life on these dangerous banks? What is your name, if you have a name? I begin to doubt you. I see that you have pointed ears. Have I been tricked into meddling with fairies, and will I discover presently that twenty years have passed, and that I am an old man long since lost to the living world, with nothing but the skeleton of my dog for company? I am Emily Bird Star of New Moon, said Emily rather coldly. She was beginning to be sensitive about her ears. Father Cassidy had remarked on them, and now Jarback Priest. Was there really something uncanny about them? And yet there was a flavor about the said Jarback that she liked, liked decidedly. Emily never was long in doubt about anyone she met. In a few minutes she always knew whether she liked, disliked, or was indifferent to them. She had a queer feeling that she had known Jarback Priest for years, perhaps because it had seemed so long when she was lying on that crumbling earth waiting for him to return. He was not handsome, but she liked that lean, clever face of his with its magnetic green eyes. "'So you're the young lady visitor at the Grange,' said Dean Priest in some astonishment. "'Then my dear Aunt Nancy should look after you better. My very dear Aunt Nancy.' "'You don't like Aunt Nancy, I see,' said Emily coolly. "'What is the use of liking a lady who won't like me? "'You have probably discovered by this time that my lady aunt detests me.' "'Oh, I don't think it's as bad as that,' said Emily. "'She must have some good opinions about you. "'She says you're the only priest who will ever get to heaven.' <laughs> "'She doesn't mean that as a compliment, whatever you and your innocence believe it to be. "'And you are Douglas Starr's daughter. "'I knew your father.' We were boys together at Queen's Academy. We drifted apart after we left it. He went into journalism and I to McGill. But he was the only friend I had at school. The only boy who would bother himself about Jarback Priest, who was lame and hunchbacked and couldn't play football or hockey. 
Emily Bird Star. Star should be your first name. You look like a star. You have a radiant sort of personality shining through you. Your proper habitat should be the evening sky just after sunset, or the morning sky just before sunrise. Yes, I think you'd be more at home in the morning sky. I think I shall call you Star. Do you mean that you think me pretty? asked Emily directly. Why, it hadn't occurred to me to wonder whether you were pretty or not. Do you think a star should be pretty? Emily reflected. No, she said finally. The word doesn't suit a star. I perceive you are an artist in words. Of course it doesn't. Stars are prismatic, palpitating, elusive. It is not often we find one made of flesh and blood. I think I'll wait for you. Oh, I'm ready to go now, said Emily, standing up. Hmm, that isn't what I meant. Never mind. Come along, star, if you don't mind walking a bit slowly. I'll take you back from the wilderness, at least. I don't know that I'll venture to Wyther Grange tonight, and I don't want Aunt Nancy to take the edge off you. So you don't think me handsome? I didn't say so, said Emily. Not in words, but I can read your thoughts, star. It won't ever do to think anything you don't want me to know. The gods gave me that gift when they kept back everything else I wanted. You don't think me handsome, but you think me nice. Do you think you are pretty yourself? A little, since Aunt Nancy lets me wear my bang, said Emily frankly. Jarback Priest made a grimace. Don't call it by such a name. It's a worse name even than bustle. Bangs and bustles, they hurt me. I like that black wave breaking on your white brows, but don't call it a bang ever again. It is a very ugly word. I never use it in my poetry, of course. Whereby Dean Priest discovered that Emily wrote poetry. He also discovered pretty nearly everything else about her in that charming walk back to Priest Pond in the fur-scented dusk, with Tweed walking me between them, his nose touching his master's hand softly every now and then, while the robins in the trees above them whistled blithely in the afterlight. With nine out of ten people, Emily was secretive and reserved, but Dean Priest was sealed of her tribe, and she divined it instantly. He had a right to the inner sanctuary, and she yielded it unquestioningly. She talked to him freely. Besides, she felt alive again. She felt the wonderful thrill of living again after that dreadful space when she had seemed to hang between life and death. She felt, as she wrote to her father afterwards, as if a little bird was singing in her heart. And oh, how good the green sod felt under her feet. She told him all about herself and her doings and beings. Only one thing did she not tell him, her worry over Ilsa's mother. That she could not speak of to anyone. Aunt Nancy need not have been frightened that she would carry tales to New Moon. I wrote a whole, whole poem yesterday when it rained and I couldn't get out, she said. It began, I sit by the western window that looks on Malvern Bay. Am I not to hear the whole of it? asked Dean, who knew perfectly well that Emily was hoping he would ask it. Emily delightedly repeated the whole poem. When she came to the two lines she liked best in it, perhaps in those wooded islands that gem the proud bay's breast, she looked up sideways to see if he admired them, but he was walking with eyes cast down and an absent expression on his face. She felt a little disappointed. Hmm, he said when she had finished. You're twelve, didn't you say? When you're ten years older, I shouldn't wonder, but let's not think of it. Father Cassidy told me to keep on, cried Emily. Well, there was no need of it. You would keep on anyhow. You have the itch for writing born in you. It's quite incurable. What are you going to do with it? I think I shall be either a great poetess or a distinguished novelist, said Emily reflectively. <laughs> Having only to choose, remarked Dean dryly, better be a novelist. I hear it pays better. What worries me about writing novels, confided Emily, is the love talk in them. I'm sure I'll never be able to write it. I've tried, she concluded candidly, and I can't think of anything to say. Don't worry about that. I'll teach you some day," said Dean. Will you? Will you really? Emily was very eager. I'll be so obliged if you will. 
I think I could manage everything else very nicely. It's a bargain, then. Don't forget it. And don't go looking for another teacher, mind. What do you find to do at the Grange besides writing poetry? Are you never lonesome with only those two old survivals? No, I enjoy my own company, said Emily gravely. You would. Stars are said to dwell apart, anyhow, sufficient unto themselves, and sphered in their own light. Do you really like Aunt Nancy? Yes, indeed. She is very kind to me. She doesn't make me wear sunbonnets, and she lets me go barefooted in the forenoons. But I have to wear my button boots in the afternoons, and I hate button boots. Naturally. You should be shod with sandals of moonshine and wear a scarf of sea mist with a few fireflies caught in it over your hair. Star, you don't look like your father, but you suggest him in several ways. Do you look like your mother? I never saw her. All at once, Emily smiled demurely. A real sense of humor was born in her at that moment. Never again was she to feel quite so unmixedly tragic over anything. No, she said. It's only my eyelashes and smile that are like mother's. But I've got father's forehead and grandma star's hair and eyes and great uncle George's nose and aunt Nancy's hands and cousin Susan's elbows and great great grandmother Murray's ankles and grandfather Murray's eyebrows. Dean Priest laughed. A <laughs> rag bag, as we all are, he said. But your soul is your own and fire new, I'll swear to that. Oh, I'm so glad I like you, said Emily impulsively. It would be hateful to think anyone I didn't like had saved my life. I don't mind your saving it a bit. That's good, because you see your life belongs to me henceforth. Since I saved it, it's mine. Never forget that. Emily felt an odd sensation of rebellion. She didn't fancy the idea of her life belonging to anybody but herself, not even to anybody she liked as much as she liked Dean Priest. Dean, watching her, saw it and smiled his whimsical smile that always seemed to have so much more in it than mere smiling. That doesn't quite suit you. Ah, you see one pays a penalty when one reaches out for something beyond the ordinary. Take your wonderful aster home and keep it as long as you can. It has cost you your freedom. He was laughing. He was only joking, of course, yet Emily felt as if a cobweb fetter had been flung around her. Yielding to a sudden impulse, she flung the big aster on the ground and set her foot on it. Dean Priest looked on amusedly. His strange eyes were very kindly as he met hers. You rare thing, you vivid thing, you starry thing. We are going to be good friends. We, we are good friends. I'm coming up to Wyther Grange tomorrow to see these descriptions you've written of Caroline and my venerable aunt in your Jimmy book. I feel sure they're delicious. Here's your path. Don't go roaming again so far from civilization. Good night, my star of the morning. He stood at the crossroad and watched her out of sight. What a child, he muttered. I'll never forget her eyes as she lay there on the edge of death, the dauntless little soul. And I've never seen a creature who seemed so full of sheer joy in existence. She is Douglas Starr's child. He never called me Jarback. He stooped and picked up the broken aster. Emily's heel had met it squarely, and it was badly crushed. But he put it away that night between the leaves of an old volume of Jane Eyre, where he had marked a verse. All glorious rose upon my sight, that child of shower and gleam. Come back tomorrow for chapter 27.